Hey, welcome to the Art Condition Podcast, a weekly show that will discuss the business, community, and often undiscussed stress and mental health concerns of being a professional artist or even a serious hobbyist. I'm Joby. I've been in the tattoo and illustration professions for 25 years. My co-host is Moose, a data analyst, social media manager, and art agent. If you enjoy the content, please consider visiting the Patreon page and the show notes to help support the effort. Or if that's not an option, please like, subscribe, leave a good review, or just share with your friends. And definitely go visit the links of our guests on this episode. Thanks for listening, and have a great day. Let's turn off the starting soon. And let us be starting now. Great. Live. And go. Okay, Brian, tell us all about it. The floor is yours. All about your oh, podcast? <laughs> <laughs> what's what's I'll the name? I'll tell you of, all about myself, though. What is this? Yeah. What, what is the name of this podcast? Brian, tell us everything about you. Who are you? What do you do? Why are you here? So I'm Brian Perry. I'm the director of marketing for Dungeons and Dragons. Um, been uh, recently uh, in the director position just a few months ago. Before that, I was working on Magic Gathering for. Um, for many years at Wizards of the Coast, uh, before that, Xbox, uh, and before that, uh, digital marketing agency for uh, five, six years. What, what so far? I don't know if you can answer this question. It's just curiosity for my sake. What's what's mm-hmm. okay? Let me ask it this way: compare and contrast a little bit what you did for when you were working for magic compared to what you're doing for D D now yeah um it's almost it's uh it's almost like two different companies in a good way um you know get very different teams working on very different products uh obviously we're part of the same company um but uh yeah it's it's kind of very different approach um so moving from magic to dungeons dragons you know i've been playing uh D and D a lot since fifth edition came out. Um, we've had the exact same campaign going now for four years. Um, same exact campaign. We were meeting remotely before this whole thing happened. So, anyways, um, we I've been playing D and D for a long time. So I was really excited when I had the opportunity to move on to um, to Dungeons Dragons for Magic. Um, but it is uh, it's kind of very, very uh, more different than um, than you'd expect in terms of just how know both um both the games work what what appealed to you about marketing like how what kind of drew you into that as an an area of expertise i think every good marketer probably has the same um psychological backings that might lead them to be marketer which is they want to be people pleaser um so (laughs) it's me too um so like if for for me uh one of the things that is like my entire life is i actually got more joy out of people experiencing thing i loved than me loving it myself it's like a weird thing i know but that's just that's just me so i think naturally that's what eventually led me to um to marketing but um the reason why I love games marketing is uh, growing up, I did every form of liberal arts. I've published a book, a uh, very bad novel. Don't, don't worry about reading it. <laughs> um, I've written music. Uh, I used to direct uh, student films. Um, and, uh, and I also learned uh, coding. And video games are literally all that combined into one. And the marketing of games is um, it's like it's on the cutting edge of of entertainment marketing because um, you have to balance so many different things together at at once. You have a really passionate fan base who wants to know more about the game. Uh, you have an entertainment property who sometimes you treat almost like movie marketing, um, but there's there's this whole community aspect and ongoing play aspect that a movie doesn't have. Uh, so it's just it's a marriage of so many tr- different forms of marketing to one that I, I could never imagine leaving the gaming industry at least at least for now. As a quick follow up to that, I know that you're like uh, big on the 
front edge of marketing tech. Like you were jumping into Twitch and YouTube and stuff like that, probably at the early stages of that, what before that was like hard coded. And uh, when I was approaching you to be on with us, you mentioned that uh, you could talk to Twitch uh, people and uh, YouTube people all day. Uh, what, uh, I know some of our uh, viewers are interested in moving into that territory and just like a, I don't know, a quick note, like what would you generally advise to people? Like what's the, the cliff notes version of your talks to those people? Yeah. So um, it really depends on what you want to use Twitch or YouTube for. If you want to use it as an extension of something else that you are selling, um, then um, I'd be wary. Uh, having a great presence on Twitch and YouTube means having a high dedication to providing something that is either uh, high entertainment or high information. Um, those, Because those are the two things people are searching for when they're looking up any video content. Is it going to entertain me or is it going to inform me? Uh, so uh, the longer I've been in marketing, the more I realize there's nothing new under the sun. That's why I kind of like to use generalities than specifics. Uh, like there's... You'll always find a new craze about things that you can do to play with the algorithms to get your your YouTube video posted higher. But that will that's always sh uh, shifting sands or shifting sands. That's going to change, um, you know, within months, what have you. So, like, really, it's just got to come back to if you want to dedicate your time to Twitch or YouTube, first, really dedicate yourself to it. And they should just focus on who you want to make content for and if you're entertaining them or informing them and then give them the best entertainment or the best information in that space that you are really passionate about. It's that simple. And I, it's, that's, um, I know it's not like revolutionary, but that's what I've found is just follow your passions, know, know your audience, and uh, usually um, the rest kind of works itself out. Um, I'll also say both Twitch and YouTube have you know, yearly conventions. A lot of times, a lot of information comes out from both those partners, uh, just about new tech, uh, new services, new offerings, and um, talks about sort of how to best use the platform. So if you're curious about what's the, the newest thing, um, just follow along with that inf that information coming out of um, a VidCon or um, TwitchCon. So what about for um, people who don't want to invest uh, their own time making their uh, their own presence on the platform, but what if they wanted to uh, advertise on Twitch or uh, YouTube. What is, let's say they have a uh, a D and D module that they're making, and they want to advertise it. How would they know to do that, or how would they best do that? Yeah, and again, it, it all it always comes back to who's your audience. Um, so I'm a big fan of a marketer, um, Seth Godin, uh, and he he's always said something that I um, I believe wholeheartedly as well, which is market to the people who you know will love your game. Um, and so I'm kind of saying this in a roundabout way because, okay, say you have a d, &D module that, that you've worked on and you're thinking of, do I work with a content creator? Well, think about, is my thing going to be fun, played live? Um, is it going to reach the people who would want to play this if I go for you know this, this, one, um, this one live streamer? Um, is it going to be fun to watch on a YouTube video? And will that YouTuber reach my audience? So it kind of starts out with first, what have you made? Who is going to love it the most? Are there content creators out there who reach those fans? Only at that point should you look at um, working with um, Twitch content creators and, and YouTube content creators. And honestly, the best place to start is um, reach out to them and have and just start with a more um, organic dialogue. Um, sometimes, you know, YouTubers and Twitch streamers. Um, they they like they're also looking for the next thing to love, right? So sometimes they want to check out new things, and if it's cool enough, they might just like play it, and it might take off on on its own. Um, if there's a more specific message you want to tell, that's where you would need to you know pay them to have sponsored content that um, gets into the exact message you you want them to tell. How much do you think? Uh... Like, how do you determine how much to, to, to spend on this uh, sort of marketing if you want to go down that route? Yeah, so um, spend in Twitch and YouTube, it's still the Wild West. Um, I have been working in this space for a long time, and um, 
the there's there's no there's no exact market cap um, or uh, or limit. It's all based on cost per view, though. That's uh, so for YouTube, it's cost per view, and a view is somebody's watched for at least thirty seconds. Twitch, it's cost per view or hours. So somebody who's actually watched that stream for an hour. Um, so if you have like three hundred concurrent viewers and you stream for an hour and they all watch for the hour, then that's 300 viewer hours that you've generated. Um, so that's the model you should look at of just basically look at that person's uh, past reach and, and past videos that are similar to the ones that you're the one you're thinking about. And then um, that'll give you exactly what kind of viewership you might expect. And then, um, you know, then you should weigh their cost, uh, their cost in terms of what kind of viewership you're going to get out of it. Now, the the cost per um, the cost per view and cost per viewer hour is variable depending on the content creator and a lot of times um, they don't even have an industry standard that they're all kind of moving towards um, so uh, generally for YouTube it can be anywhere from five cents per view to like twelve cents per view um, that you're paying really dep depend again depending on that person and who they're reaching and what what country they're in. Um, and then Twitch, because it's um, it's you know more engagement over a longer time of viewer hours means that person watched for an hour. Uh, that is more like twenty five cents per viewer hour to over a dollar per viewer hour. Again, depending on the engagement that person gets. This is all incredible information. I'm gonna have to go back and re-listen to this. A few times myself because it's <laughs> i'm i'm one of those people well, that is like fascinated by the the numbers and 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 get very but it, man it takes me a long time for it to sink into my monkey brain you know like <laughs> what the well what and the it's wild west like i was is. saying yeah it's taken it's taken me um it's taken me years of working with at this point, probably close to a thousand different content creators directly, just to even get to that range. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's uh, there's there's no standard, and um, I don't know if there's ever going to be really a standard either. Um, the best you can do is honestly, as you're working, because it's, it's very different per space and per genre too. As you're working, just keep a track of what that cost is. Uh, if if you want to invest in this, keep track of what that cost is um, for uh, for somebody you're working with. And just see, like, at that at some point, you'll start to get to an average. Mm -hmm. And so, like, the first few you work with, you'll probably be, you know, you'll, you'll be uninformed because you're entering a new space and you, you're not sure what to pay. Um, and that's, that's just okay. That's just kind of how it is. Um, but as you work with more, you'll start to get the sense of an average. So now, yeah. for me, I know when I go after a certain genre of uh, content creator, I know the average I want to get them to. Yeah, so let's let's lean on that just for a second, because it I know if I were listening to this, it would make me feel better just to hear the reassurance that it doesn't have to make sense out of the box right away. There's a lot of um, data mining that you have to do on your own content over a period of time before you even start getting a picture of like, where should I be spending my time? What should I be spending it on? Like all of those kinds of things that you're there's no like mathematical equation that Brian can write out for you that's then going to be applicable to your circumstance in any given situation. So it's okay. Just no. like, yeah, just breathe, let it <laughs> just just marinate in it and just start collecting your own data, you know, and just and, and don't and actually again like going back to why the more I'm in marketing the more I realize nothing's new under the sun. Because you can get it to a mathematical, you know, cost per view, cost per view hour. You know what matters more? That's great content that person made for you. Mm -hmm. That's going right. to matter way more yeah. than uh, than any sort of getting them to the right cost per view. So, so uh, at least that's one thing you can be informed on is knowing when you're working with a content creator, like this is going to be fun content. People are going to want to either again entertaining or informing. Either this is going to provide really great information in a way that people want to consume it, like short, concise. Uh, I'm a huge fan of binging with Babish, um, and Binging Babish is like this cooking channel, and uh, he had this whole thing of the reason why he believes he was successful is because he saw all these YouTube cooking shows that spent like five minutes of preamble before getting into the recipes. And so he said, you know what? I'm just going to start immediately 
just right into the recipe. So I'm just going to give you exactly what you need, like go right into it. And then his channel's taken off. So like similarly, that's like on the informed side. And on the entertainment side, you know, is usually you should have that content creator pitch you an idea because you want it to be authentic to them. And so if that idea on the entertainment side sounds really fun and you could see why you would want to watch it, then like then that's probably worth investing in. So um, that's one area where you, you know, you uh, you can just use kind of more logic to determine if uh, if you think the content's going to give you what you want. One example. And don't of that work is... with the content creator uh, who is kind of more in it just for like they cut and copy or copy and paste something they've done before, um, because they're probably not going to put in the the effort to make something really cool. So make sure you're working with somebody who is coming to the table with ideas and you know wants to do something fun with you. One example of that is from your. Uh your arena launch where you got that uh, one comedian, the uh, guy who made the milk counters uh, commercial. Oh yeah. Pro ZD. Yeah. Yeah. He was fun. He was fun to work with. Um, yeah. Uh, I worked with Pro ZD on this, um, this uh, magic. Um, yeah. This, this like quick magic video where he made up his, his entire own game of, uh, of uh, this cow card game. Uh, it, was, it was really funny. Like I got the script and I was like, yeah, this is going to be great. Uh, I know this is going to be perfect. We're we're just going to move forward with this, and it's still being shared around as a result. Yeah, yes, <laughs> it's pretty crazy. Um, I want to uh, talk about the like just like the very idea of marketing as a as a dirty word. <laughs> um, so oh yeah, we, yeah. So, so that we can clean it up a little bit. Um, it's uh, related terms like networking and promotion and things like that. They, they kind of get a, a bad rap, especially with artists, you know, when, when, you know, a lot of artists kind of like internalize this notion that like, you know, art should be pure and you know, you, it's, it's, it, it's like inherently anti-capitalistic and it, it, all of that, like that's a debate for another time. Um, but it, it essentially boils down to feeling disingenuous. Um, like you're somehow like trying to trick people, you know, or like lying to them or whatever. Uh, what what can artists or other creatives, any any creative, um, do to help themselves think about marketing in a healthier way? How can we all think about marketing in a in a healthier way and approach it productively, rather, and kind of like help shed this like uh, this weight this burden of like, Oh God, I have to, I have to market myself. You know, like people will just dread that, you know, you say the word marketing to some people and they're like, yeah, it's easy. Give people value. Like, that's the best marketing. Um, mm -hmm. like making, nobody cares about your website ads. Um, so the average person sees 5,000 ads a day. Nobody cares about, uh, about ads and actually think about your, Okay, what is like the best advertisement you've ever seen? I probably didn't know that it was advertising. <laughs> is my exactly. cheeky answer. <laughs> Actually, yeah, that was, you got my trick question. Okay. Like the best advertising <laughs> isn't advertising. The uh -huh. best kind of the and it's that so like the best kind of marketing isn't advertising. It's giving you value. Uh and so focus focus on that. Um focus on like what are things that people that people will find value in. That's actually that's what led to the rise in content marketing, which is and now a bit of a dirty word. But back in the day, you know, when like corporations started having blogs, it was because people realized, like, you know, your local plumber, how are they going to stand above every other plumber in the area? Well, they can start putting out tips for like, you know, things that you can do to check out your your own bathroom. Um, and you know things that you can do at home and suddenly then they're getting more traffic they're getting more eyeballs in their content and then they're more trusted because they're giving value to um to customers so um focus on g giving people value first and that i think that's also how you feel better too because you're you're like you're giving that that value to people um the tough part is like especially in art how do you give value without giving away your actual stuff that you want people to buy from you right yeah um so like i think it's similar to actually going back to the the plumber analogy like you're going to read all this content from this plumber but you're not going to get them to come out to your house to make to like fix your toilet for free so they're giving you information and i think like as an artist you can still kind of 
you know, inform and, and critique and have conversations online without, like, I don't think you ever should go down the, the route of like, I'm going to do free commissions for people. Um, mm. I think it's more informing. And I think another thing that I, I've previously talked about is you could, um, to help build up some, um, some sort of following for yourself, um, you know, you, you could look at just like what you love to make art wise uh, that resonates with pop culture. And sometimes uh, like uh, media outlets are starting to pick up really cool art. Like I know every few weeks I see a new media outlet picking up somebody who's made uh, hyper realistic 3D renders of uh, Pokemon and they, and they look disgusting. Right? <laughs> but, but that that artist is kind of like getting getting themselves known. That's like a 3D artist who is trying to land a job in the gaming industry. So uh, it all goes back though to think about what value you can provide. And to clarify another concept. Uh, or another set of concepts and put us all on the same page. Um, can you compare and contrast marketing versus advertising and, and also, but talk a little bit about where they do overlap? Yeah. So advertising is, you know, a portion of marketing and it's becoming a smaller and smaller portion of marketing. So uh, as I said before, but, the average person sees 5,000 ads a day. And that was from a 2007 study. So like nowadays, I, I can't even imagine. And more than half of people in the US are using ad blockers. Um, so advertising um, in the way that people think about it doesn't really, doesn't work on its own. Um, the more powerful part of marketing, and marketing is just, like it's such, it's such a broad term that it just basically means promoting your content. Um, or, or honestly, just like bringing the people to the house that you've built. Uh, mm. So it's it, it is all encompassing of any sort of tactics or or strategies um, that you would empl uh, employ to just bring new customers to yourself. Um, so like marketing is really like you know all encompassing. Like even your email once you've delivered something for to a client. Your email thanking them—that's marketing. Like it's so marketing is just a really it can it can be any interaction, um, which is why if you if you just put some sort of a marketing mindset on everything you do, and I'm not saying like you know go into uh, sh into like shilling mode all times because you're going to turn people off, but just just put it in into your mind just you know how you put an additional marketing mind on everything you do. You'll find some interesting things. Um, that you could maybe uh, take care of. The last point I want to bring up is just what is marketing? Um, marketing and how to effectively market, because it's such a broad term, you have to start from uh, uh, the why. And the, the, where you start from the why is understanding the audience you're making your stuff for. So every single facet of marketing comes from knowing your audience, knowing how they consume content, um, and knowing how they might and having ideas of how they might love your product and then any of those pathways to them is marketing i really like what something that you just said um bring people to the house that you made that's for me i just kind of had a little like mini aha moment that makes a lot of sense to me and i am hoping that it can resonate with a lot of other people to help cast off some sensation of the other thing that you addressed you know of like put you know like don't feel like you're you have to be shilling all of the time because that's the thing that turns people off and mm -hmm. uh, kind of prevents them from stepping into that mode more often and doing a better job of of marketing their own work is that they, they just like they they have that image of the snake oil salesman as a caricature and the last thing that they want to do is become that but this idea of like show bring people to the house that you made show off like be proud of what you're doing and see it as this thing that you're excited about that you want to tell other people about everybody can relate to that i mean of within reason people are shy artists are shy we have a lot of fucking tortured angst about showing our artwork to the rest of the world but thinking about it more in that term terminology i think can go a long way towards 
alleviating some of that stress about are people going to think of me as a snake oil salesman if you just think about it as like no you're talking about something that you're stoked on and come to my house look at these cool decorations and look at this nifty trick that I did in my kitchen to save space and like you know like that's awesome like people want to know about that right yeah yeah and and just on the snake oil salesman <laughs> nowadays if you want to be a snake oil salesman you have to go really deep down a rabbit hole to be successful like i'm talking <laughs> click farm generation <laughs> websites like that is you have to go so far down the barrel to be a successful snake oil salesman mm. the the really the good news is um nowadays um like the people are just looking for honest open communications and honest open people and um they're not looking for BS and the BS meters of everybody is so much higher nowadays. Uh, so, um, th the good news is like, uh, the best way to market yourself is just be, be yourself <laughs> and you'll find that that's way better than, um, than trying to, uh, than trying to like take on a personality that isn't yours unless, unless you're an asshole, <laughs> then like yeah. you, you need like a great thing is also the nice guys, the nice people are, um, are, doing well in this new world order where you don't have to um you don't have to be a backstabber to to move forward and you know um being nice goes a long way yeah so and, uh, sorry i just want to wrap up one more thing about that um the thing that you said about uh having to go a long way down a deep rabbit hole to hit snake oil salesman level i i, I guess i would only add and get your thoughts on this as well that it, it may be before we even get that far into the caricature of shilling and sales pitchiness i know for myself i sometimes get into this downward spiral of like hearing the advice of be authentic be yourself be genuine but now i'm in this position where i'm thinking about being authentic and i'm thinking about being genuine which automatically puts me on the back foot in the sense that I now feel disingenuous and dishonest because I'm like, I'm calculating about how I should be like, I, you know, like the, the examples are many where I've been talking to somebody and something along the, it's not always this example every time, but it's like something along the lines of like, well, I have this Twitch channel where I talk about this a lot and Twitch is a great place to meet people, you know? And then it's like, Oh, like I, Feel this like oh god are they gonna like interpret that as like and you know i'm just like promo and maybe this isn't the best example but you maybe you kind of know where i'm coming from i might i got a follow-up question to you did you get excitement out of talking about that like your your twitch channel to like this hypothetical person yes but it's not it, it's not necessarily <sighs> the intellectual knowledge of like what another person's receptivity to it is going to be. It's, it's the resistance that I encounter and I'm just imagining other people will encounter when they're confronted with that, um, perceived double standard of be authentic, but then also have in mind the objective of being authentic, you know, Mm -hmm. is that and it, this and, uh, yeah that, that that being said i am a fucking overly analytical person sometimes so it's well within the realm of possibility that i'm just overthinking all of this <laughs> so I'll, I'll leave i'll leave room for that as well hmm. by your silence i'm going to take that as a uh, <laughs> confirmation <laughs> well no i i guess what i i was just thinking about is um so if you if you kind of getting to the back to that that kind of hypothetical scenario where like where you're talking to somebody and it's like do I tell them that I make art and like here's my website I've been on the receiving end of a lot of that where like you know every time I have a conversation somebody kind of ends with like and here's my business card um, and like I think for some people if they're like the better place to kind of go is uh, talk just talk about what you're so excited about so like rather than kind of giving your whole spiel um and this is definitely i'm like overgeneralizing because every person is different and the things you're comfortable with are very different 
Um, but like instead of you know giving your whole spiel about your your background as an artist, focus on the coolest piece of art that you're proudest of, uh, and just like you know if you're talking to somebody and like talk about that um, mm-hmm. that piece and like show and show that off. Uh, I think that's like will be you know that'll probably get you way further than uh, talking in generalities with somebody about how you're an artist who works on this for people. Right, and and most all of this mostly is just to triple quadruple underscore the love that i'm having for that thing that you said of just bring people to the house that you that you built and it was just to maybe bring us one step um down the road from like just like the snake oil salesman character that you said is like actually hard to find but then there's like this maybe this spectrum where people might fall somewhere else along it that but encounter the same resistance as a as a result Anyway, we mm-hmm. we don't have to dwell too much longer. Moose, you were, if you still recall what you were going to say, I know you were going to jump in on something. Yeah, so I know a lot of the, the people that are in this community are uh, they're artists, but they're also planning to make uh, or in the process of making a five E or general tabletop RPG uh, products. So not just character illustrations, but also like modules or DM supplements, that sort of thing. So I'm curious, uh, now that you're actually in the D&D uh, marketing division, how do you guys plan on uh, marketing D&D to basically the same uh, customers that these people are hoping to find? Yeah. Um, so it actually goes back to entertain or inform. Like, what are you getting? So, and with D&D specifically, uh, the inform part is expanding somebody's toolbox I gave them sub new subclasses, new spells, something that just gives them more content to, to uh, a bigger toolbox to play around with. Um, or are you entertaining? You're you're making an adventure for somebody to play, and I think understanding that first uh, is important because they 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 hit people in two different ways. Um, so for a adventure. Like obviously, people want to know if it's going to be fun to run with their friends, um, and so like your your job is to really show like your job is to show the most fun state of what you've built, um, and that's that can be done in excerpts. That could be done in like that's where something like a you know one shot Twitch or YouTube video with somebody to show that off can um, can do wonders uh, too, um, and then. Um, on the toolbox, and you know, you're you made new content for basically like first your audience there is dungeon masters because you've you've made more content for them. Uh, and like sure, some players will get an enjoyment out of reading this, but it all comes back to will the dungeon master allow that at their table? Uh, so you have, you kind of have to think about the dungeon master first there. And so so there, just think like you know, think about what um, what kind of information a dungeon master would want to know um, to figure out if this. It's their content, and like honestly, it goes back to um, most most aren't perusing. Um, well, actually, you have to think about where they peruse for inspiration for their adventures. Um, and a lot of them, when they get to the point of a toolbox, um, they have an idea of what tools they need. Um, so your job is to be as succinct as possible and explain to them what tools you would this module would provide to them. Um, because you know the majority of, of um, DMs run uh, homebrew content and you know love making their own adventures. And the reason why they, they DM is uh, because they want to tell their own stories. So uh, when you're making content for them, um, that's what they're looking for. Is this going to help me tell my story better? And so, how would they get that message across to people in general? Like, how do, what, what do they, uh, where do they put this information for people to find it? Um, well, I mean, it depends on what platform you are selling your content on. So obviously, there's DMs Guild. Um, people use Kickstarter. Um, there's a variety of other means for you to um, showcase this content. So, I mean, it goes as simple as product description, like. A lot of people kind of overlook that, but your product description is by far the most important thing because the product description is one of the last things people see before they purchase your product. 
but it's the thing that converts somebody from intending to purchase to actually purchase. Um, so think about that. Uh, and then um, and the reason I'm giving generalities is because there's so many ways people can find the information. Um, so I mean, a lot of the D&D subreddits are very well um, visited, um, but they're very kind of particular about not being an ad space for people's content. Um, so like the best way to, if you want to work in those spaces is to in, engage and, you know, find ways to talk with like-minded people looking for stuff like yours, um, or look for, you know, different content creators who are making content similar to yours, um, sh and showing it to them. Uh, the other thing that is true in most art and gaming communities, uh, is, Asking people for uh, early critique of your work first makes your work better. Second, um, exposes it to uh, and second exposes it to people. Um, so that can be another strategy for how when you're working on an adventure or a module or even you know piece of art um, to get people uh, get some early critiques from people on it. Um, like there's a great example of that I, I'm part of the the game dev. Um, community and this one dev has been sharing these the screenshots from this like 2d norse game um sorry no that's on the unreal engine subreddit um he's been sharing screenshots for like two years of this 2d norse game of just in progress and getting getting people's feedback that game was just in the xbox showcase back in august as one of the games on there and so like the whole unreal engine community celebrated with them like oh my god we helped with this and like we we, we got to see this along and and suddenly that that game's in a better place because like it's already kind of built this following of people who've been um critiquing and you know providing support along the way so that leads into the next question like when is it too early to start sharing your content with people is it ever too early to start um i mean you you have to you have to have enough for people to potentially be excited by it. Uh, so like, um, if you're working on a D&D adventure, uh, it's probably too early if you say, I had this general idea of like, maybe there's like a paladin and he's turned evil and he and you have to fight him and he's on the top of a mountain. What do you all think? Like way too early. <laughs> I'm not excited reading that. <laughs> huh. um, so, I uh, wait until it's at an exciting point, either visually or um, you can share kind of tidbits that, of a story that um, could be really exciting. Um, so that that's yeah, that's my recommendation is as soon as there's something exciting, you can feel free to feel free to share it. Um, you, I wanted to dive in uh, unless Moose, you had another follow up question. Nope. Um, dig in a little bit more on something that you said about product description being one of the most important things. Um, and you talked a little bit about it in relation to like the D and D content creation. Um, but I would like to maybe broaden it just a little bit more and talk in more general terms to the degree that you feel comfortable doing this. Cause I know that there are no like universal truths when it comes to this kind of thing. A lot is, product dependent but um are there what kind of details in general do you think are like most effective uh when it comes to you know accessing uh getting interest from your potential buyers like what kind of things should what are the details people should be focusing on in that product description to hook people in and get them in and keep them interested there is one universal truth um what i gave you is not that um, the one universal truth, which has always been true um, since the beginning of time and the beginning of marketing, and it's even actually more true today, despite of how, uh, despite how connected we are online, uh, your recommendations from friends. Um, now, even more so, I, um, I was reading a recent study that people are now, uh, so friend recommendations is the number one reason, always has been, of why you buy something. Um, and uh, obviously, it's product dependent, right? Um, and uh, even 
a new thing that's happening is people will recommend products without even trying them because they've heard good buzz from a friend. So um, I call this percolation of, uh, of interest. I bring this up because um, having a good track record is, is uh, going to help you in the long run. And so if the previous customer is very happy with a product they purchase of you, that will do you so many wonders down the road. So, so think about like that's why you should actually think about your uh, like the customer ahead of you and the the player ahead of you, um, making sure they have a great experience. Because if they do, um, them sharing that with any friend is just going to do. Um, it's it's it is going to be one of the best ways uh, for some for somebody to spread. So, the focus on. Um, comes down to focus on making great products. <laughs> like a lot of marketing comes back to make the great products and then use marketing to um, to just uh, validate and make it bigger. So I actually have a follow-up to that. And it goes back to uh, when we were at GDC and you shared me this slide that showed the more money that someone spent on marketing had a bigger influence than the uh, more money spending on the development. So isn't what you just said to that like a little bit counter? Yeah. No, I'm glad you brought that up. Okay, so there's this isn't video game marketing. So um there's four quadrants um of this analysis of games and marketing done. Um game with high Metacritic score, high marketing dollars spent, uh low Metacritic score, low marketing dollars spent. And then your two sides are high dollar spent, low Metacritic score, low dollar spent, high Metacritic score. Um so as you would expect, high dollar spend, high Metacritic score does the best. Like that, that game gets the most revenue uh, by far. So comparing those, and then obviously you, like low spend, low Metacritic score is just going to do bad, right? That's, that's understood. So comparing the other two parts, uh, the other two quadrants. So what does better? High Metacritic score, low marketing, low Metacritic score, uh, high marketing. And the low Metacritic score, high marketing does better. One thing, though, is like, so that that might say like, okay, so if you have a bad product, marketing will overcome it. Yes, but we're talking about millions of dollars. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, if you have a thousand dollars, honestly, you're not going to move the needle. Like, that's just not enough to move this marketing needle. Um, so you're talking about games that are AAA quality that have spent millions in marketing, and so therefore they're just going to have a higher floor. And so the last thing I'll say there is. Most important thing is the high marketing dollars and the high Metacritic score. That revenue take is is exponentially higher than any of these other three quadrants. So, like the best spend on advertising is when you have something that works. That's going to do way better for you. Um, don't spend ads on something that's not working uh, because you're going to throw money down down the drain. Uh, like if you have a product that you've made or a piece of art that's doing very well that's what you market um versus kind of trying to use marketing to bolster up the things not doing as well because that that's the that's the winning combo right there um so that's actually kind of the the meta takeaway from that and it would also seem that the um reputation built on so so putting out a bad product and having the marketing dollars to rescue it sort of proves point or it's like the exception that proves the, the greater point that you're making because that marketing dollars ostensibly came from reputation built on previously you know uh previously made well-received products good products <laughs> so i'm thinking about like diablo 3 and star wars <laughs> things that yeah later on uh yeah go ahead no, I'm trying to think of, I'm sure there actually are examples probably of just bad reputation, so much money spent that they overcame it. It's, um, if you spend, you can spend enough money to eventually get to where you need to if you have infinite dollars, but it's an uphill battle. So, and that's more of my, my, like, um, that's more of what I'm getting at here is, um, this is kind of a, a vector that, the only the mega corporations get to actually achieve because they can spend like if if you need to help a product 
go up to a um, you know, go up to a certain number of uh, installs or new players, um, and you just will are willing to throw any money at you can at it. You can eventually achieve it, but you are getting diminishing returns, and a lot of times you're actually spending more to acquire a player than they're actually giving you in return. And like that's so, that's a, a key thing in marketing is you look at how much you're spending to acquire a person versus what you're getting re in return, and usually you're spending more at that that point. You're actually losing right. money. Right. So our people that are listening probably don't have those mega billion dollars. We're we're not uh, exactly uh, a podcast yeah. for and if you do call me. or whatever. Yeah, we'll take some farm <laughs> right. right. I, I was kind of using that as an example to show like if this is not an area that you can ever get to work. Um, right. So it, it, like not at scale. That means like what can somebody in our uh, in our bracket of uh, being able to spend I don't know like five hundred to five thousand dollars be able to accomplish and like. What role can fr our friends play in helping us with the marketing or advertising of our product? Yeah, so um, let's get at first if you have dollars to spend on advertising. Where do you put it? Who do you, like? Who do you go to? Again, start with the audience, and um, that's why like that's why a lot of people make products for themselves because it's easy to understand yourself and your proclivities. Uh, and so um, that'll help you better understand your audience. But think about, you know, how they consume content, uh, where they go to. Um, and, you know, if um, think about yourself and where you consume content, where you go to and what are the areas where you have enough information to maybe want to buy something. Um, so if uh, if that is, say, YouTube and like the way that you, and you've made products for basically yourself and people like yourself and you think about yourself and hey like I watch YouTube videos for like new board games and that's enough for me to make me get a uh, buy a board game that's probably then where you should look at is okay so if I have like 500 to uh, five thousand dollars I look at like you know one or two youtubers who hit the board gaming crowd um, to play my board game um, so it's it starts with with audience and uh, where you need to go um, what I'd also say, though, is again, five hundred to five thousand. It's you know, that's not going to suddenly make you successful. The fundamentals of um, of understanding your audience, knowing where to reach them, and trying community engagement will probably bring you further than spending a few hundred bucks. Uh, so, again, think about where you consume content. And if you're make if you made content for people like you, that's probably where they consume content too. To start, uh, start having community engagement on those platforms. Whether it's creating your own, you know, say it's Twitter, like make sure you've you know you've created a Twitter account and that account is engaging with people, um, in in the right way. And what that allows you to do, the reason why I'm talking about these fundamentals is look at what is working in community engagement and getting people engaging with content. That's what you market. That's what you spend the dollars on. The things that you finally see, like, hey, this seems to be moving the needle. Don't go in blind and say, like, okay, if I spend five hundred bucks on like a Twitter post, like that, that let's see if that makes it. You don't know enough yet. Test it. Try try things out. Um, see what is organically driving community engagement, and that's the thing that's going to uh, do. That's the thing that's going to do better for you. So then it's um, not. To, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, no, no. I was gonna hit the friends thing sec, but I can, I'll hit that second. Uh, yeah, Later. I would. I would just follow up on that real quick to clarify one thing. Um, if you do have, if your threshold is relatively low, you know, five thousand dollars, as much as that might seem to some people, that's still like wow, big money for a lot. It's not to say that you're better off just not spending that. It's it's more that you have to be. 5,000 times more particular about where you spend it. Is that a, a, a takeaway f that I could make from what you're saying? Uh, yeah, you just have to, um, it's better to know when something's already working to spend money on it. Um, there's less risk there. And um, in general, advertising on social media platforms is high risk because there's way too much of it. And so you're competing with, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of, of others. Um, so that's why 
that's why again like starting with community engagement and seeing what about your content is engaging with people then that's the thing that you market um so it, it removes um it removes a bit of risk and a bit of this unknown because especially as you're getting used to marketing you're not going to know what's the thing like what's the right picture or the right text that gets people to want to learn more about the product you just made you need a bit of you need just a, a bit of testing and experience to know to know that okay and we can move on to the how can your friends help you with the marketing and advertising yeah yeah depends on how good the friends they are <laughs> so <laughs> um, like yeah you can ask your friends like you know hey do you mind um do you mind like posting about this on on your channels like sure um and if they're good friends they'll 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 do that for you i think that's like what's more valuable is is again to think about the strangers who bought the stuff you've made previously um and keeping a, a connection with them um making sure they're making sure they're satisfied with what they bought um and you know they that they enjoyed it and um first off they're more likely to be your repeat customer um if they because if they liked it and you make new stuff then they probably are going to like that new stuff too um and this is how people build a following so um it, like that's i think that's actually um where you should focus maybe more of your time on is the people who have previously purchased stuff from you um and i'm not saying like being creepy stalker like, hey, are you okay? Just want to like every day sending it like, are you okay? I want to make sure like you you like what you got. Uh, you have to give them space, but like, um, just uh, again thinking about when what they might want. Um, so uh, first, making sure like your customer service is first class. Just in, in chatting with them. That's why being nice always helps. And second, you know, like wait, and then once you have a new thing that you think that previous customers might like having a way to um, reach out to them and just say like, hey, have this new thing if you're interested. Um, that is, uh, and that could potentially build, you know, longer lasting connections. Um, that sounds like a mailing see... list or a, a Discord server or something. It's just thinking. Sure, yeah, yeah. And and that's why you see a lot of people investing time in this, like with email lists, with like, honestly, that's kind of like why a lot of companies run social media accounts because those are their repeat customers, right? Um, so um, there's nothing new under the sun there, but I'd say that's, more of your focus in terms of like how your friends can help you. Um, I don't have anything and I, I don't have any great advice there because uh, you know, like they can be an extension of you um, and it depends on how much time they want to volunteer to help you out. And so um, like there's not back in the early days, you could fool um, Google search by having like a bunch of your friends make backlinks and like, have your stuff go high that doesn't really exist anymore like having just like every time you put out something telling your um your like 20 friends hey everybody like this tweet immediately because this will help me get to trending it doesn't really like sometimes it might work but it doesn't really and it feels kind of skeevy to everybody and so anyways i yeah i just um it depends on how much time your friends have to volunteer and uh then just honestly you're asking them to help you do what you're doing um can we would it be fair to let's say that people are making something that isn't a, a product in the in the typical sense of you know like a a book or a, a game or something that i'm going to make a, a kickstarter for you know and it's more paintings that they're making uh you know prints and online store can we for the most part though just kind of like replace one-to-one -one most of the things that we've been saying about self-contained products with an ongoing production of you know of, of material that you make more as just like yeah. a, you know an artist or whatever yeah I mean, there's there's variance there but like if you are an artist who makes unique minis and every mini is unique and you don't like re resell them you can still take uh, you can still take learnings from that where if you're um, you know, if you're publicly selling them, then having those repeat customers, even if you're privately selling them, like still having that relationship. And actually, that's even more important because 
uh, then that person might come back to you and say like, hey, I need another mini for my D&D game. Um, so yeah, I, th I think it is ap applicable. Um, it, you just, I guess you have to use logic to apply it to your situation. So we have a question here in chat, and it's kind of like a question of if it's good to make a, a many uh, small products or put them all together into a big product. What do you think would be uh, more uh, beneficial in the long term? Hmm. Uh, that's a good question. I mean, it really does depend on the type of product. So. I'm I'm just gonna take a like a an assumptive leap and say like maybe this is you're talking about like an adventure and it, whether you do an anthology of adventures or release each of your adventures one after the other. Right. So let's just say that they're it, talking about a variety of classes, putting yeah. them all in a bundle, new graces, put them in a bundle, or keep everything separate and sell them like piecemeal. So another important part of this isn't even just marketing. This is just kind of business is um, iteration. And so I think it really depends on where you are in your career. If you're just getting started making modules, like D&D modules for people, I'd go s small, bite-sized, iterative, because kind of what's more important in the long run, you, you always have to think about the long run. You can't think about like this individual product needs to be successful, because it's, it's going to be really hard to keep that up. So think about the long run, and think about your early products as testing the waters, seeing what's resonating with people, and um, seeing what you might tweak. And so if you kind of wait to have that whole anthology of content, then um, you're a bit more blind, and you're not sure how well it's going to land. So I'd say early in your career, it's better to be iterative. As you get a sense for what people like, then you can do the bigger swings. And I think eventually, having like having the bigger content is more value add. So it means that you can you know, you can charge more because you're giving more value um, and you can see kind of higher returns from it. Um, but I wouldn't start there. Well, there would be a follow-up question then because there was a second half to um, his question, which was that uh, he said, my issue is that small products are not going to get me in a sound financial position. It'll basically be wasted money because what little money it would bring in would fall into a black hole maybe not wasted publicity um i i'm trying i'm trying to discern the the, the yeah. exact it was hard for me to distill that question so i just read it verbatim um and I maybe didn't. maybe part of the information here would be a little clarification um so if you were down to open the kimono a yeah, little yeah. bit more and tell us a little bit more maybe that that would help I was speaking to the to the questioner, not necessarily to you, Brian. But if you have thoughts on that, please. Yeah. Well, and and the way now you've read that, uh, I think that's you know that person has the the right thinking. Honestly, mm -hmm. um, it's your first product you're going to make is um, it's it's likely not going to be your big success uh, because you need to learn more about who you're making this for. What are your best qualities? It's going to take time, and so. Um, the tough part is um, like making, getting, getting to be your best self takes research and development. Uh, so I do, I do agree that you know having these little one-offs, um, it's not going to help you really financially. It is kind of going into the black hole because you're not going to see you know major returns. Um, but kind of to the point, like, but does it provide publicity? Yes, and more importantly, it's helping you uh, hone your craft. And so at this, it's doing two things for you. You're, you're, it's getting you some publicity because some people are starting to give, give it a following and give you feedback. And listening to that feedback is really important to know what people want. Um, it's helping you you hone your craft and potentially building a, a following. Whereas as you kind of do more and more, then um, then you know you can build more of a following. The other benefit is um, that that doesn't have to be wasted work. So let's say like you know many character classes and you're kind of releasing each one um, uh, one by one. It's OK to go back and package 10 of those up and then sell that. Um, because like you've probably, over the, over the span of like the 10 to 20 classes you've created, you've built more of a following. And you're, you don't have people going back into your original work. So like you, you can create anthologies of that old work and then tweak it 
knowing what you've like how you've honed your craft later on and that's going to provide um it's going to provide a lot of value to people suddenly so um so that that also isn't wasted work it's just probably far delayed revenue for you so i have an analogy for the artists in the group uh it's sort of like if you go for a big project out of the gate as your first uh project then it's sort of like going to an illustra- doing a full illustration from start to finish without doing thumbnails, value studies, or color studies. You're going to go with your first idea, and it might not be the best idea. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's it's tough. An analogy is hard, a bit harder with art because, like, you typically do sell each of your pieces separately, um, so you are able to iterate. Sure, I think it's a good analogy. Um, the, this ties into a, a, a little bit of something that, um, we weren't quite sure how much time we would have for, uh, over the, the long run of this conversation, um, <laughs> which was the, uh, the, you gave a talk, uh, a while ago for a small group of artists where you covered your sort of like top 10, uh, talking points for like you know good marketing strategy for creative output and products i don't want to go through the whole 10 by any means there were a few though that uh, i did asterisk as um potential expansion points or tie-ins and one of those i think comes in here a little bit um in this idea of lots of littles versus one big and then you know whatever combinations they're in um one of the uh one of the items one of the talking points that you covered in that talk was uh the netflix model um and this idea that uh the netflix model and those like it have taught consumers to binge product Mm -hmm. and reduce our attention spans and reduced our attention spans for better or worse um and so in with that in mind you know that or at your follow-up advice to that was that if you can you know don't put the the web tune out you know once every week or every couple of weeks or whatever you know put the like six volume set out all at once let people binge it um and you know that's going to generate more hype and excitement for it so can you compare that to what we were just talking about where and you know that there there may be circumstances where um output of smaller items over a longer period of time would be would be better how what's the sort of balancing act there yeah i realize that there's a there's a um really important caveat to understand with you know the the netflix model being real and people wanting to binge, binge content that's why I was saying it depends on where you are in your career, um, mm. because the the iterative model works at the beginning because what's more important is you're honing your craft. That's the more important part is you're honing your craft and you're getting you're getting better at it, um, and you're building a following. Um, when you when it's time like basically when you success moment is when you can release a bunch of content together, so. In that iterative model, um, you know, I think the important point I, I didn't make is you're not going to find success in that iterative, iterative model. That is just there to get you okay. to have better craft and to build an audience and to, to get to a better state so that when you can make the anthology, when you can make this you know, volume of content, um, it is, it's going to be way better than if you started and put it out the gates. So that's kind of that's the more important point of like yes people um, people want to binge content and so like web comic and webtoon is a great example of um, they if they have an uh, like a whole volume of like you know thirty forty issues you know it's going to sell better and and um, you know you can also sell for more um, than one every single week but getting to that point starting your story and putting out one every week helps you understand what's good about your story and your drawing style and that gets better and um and you start to build a bit of following um and then like the other cool thing is uh like i was saying at the end you can 
package all that stuff still into yeah. like one big binge model. Right, right. Uh, and that's okay because like, people people are not going to call you out on that because that's just an anthology of the content you've produced. So do you do, is there the potential to do yourself a disservice if you, you know, are, are putting out small amounts or little pieces that can then eventually be packaged into, you know, a big thing that uh, new viewers or, you know, like old fans can consume in the binge model. But then, so now everybody's like real excited about this thing that they just binged on, but they burned through it all. And you don't have anything immediately after that because, you know, you spent all your time like building up using, you know, generating hype using small incremental bursts. Then you deliver this big package. Now you kind of have to start all over again with small incrementals building up to a, a new package. Is there an effect where you're not keeping the feather in the air, so to speak, and, and you have to start all over again? Or is that a viable way to sort of like continue to generate momentum? This is, yeah, I mean, this is something we, we struggle with even at like, you know, big companies all, all the time is um, people's attention spans are getting lower and lower. I mean, you look at, you just look at video games marketing, you know, it used to be you had to tell players about an RPG like a, a year ahead of time and then excite them throughout. Now, uh, do you, does everyone remember when Elden Ring was announced, the new George uh, R. R. Martin video game? Nobody remembers it because <laughs> <laughs> it was announced years ago, no following, right? And so I bring that up because um, it's important when you're making your big content, if you want to keep that community um, going, you want to keep providing value, you have to think about what's your next project? What are like, when is the next time you want to talk with that audience you've built? You don't have to follow that iterative model. You just have to think of ways to engage with hopefully a community that you've built um, as you get onto your second big project. Because the hope is that the first, like everything, you know, that everything that built up to the first big project, built that community, built that trust, built the quality where people think like this person makes good quality content. So that you're you're able to have um, not as many check-ins. You can't go, yeah, you can't go radio silent. It's just not how the world works any, anymore, unfortunately, unless you are a savant who has made the coolest thing, you know, to exist in the internet. Mm-hmm. This reminds me of a, a GDC talk with uh, it was on Path of Exile. And they were trying a bunch of different uh, sizes of um, releases. So they're doing big leagues, small leagues, big patches, small patches. And they were being inconsistent with what they were delivering. They had no schedule to it. It was just whatever they felt like they wanted to try next. And uh, Kriparian, a Hearthstone streamer and Path of Exile streamer at the time, uh, told them, I do all my streams at the same time every day. I release a video at the same time every day. This way that people know what they're getting from me and they know... uh, what when to expect something from me and if you look at what they were doing it looked like they were making smaller and smaller content when it was just them trying stuff so it looked like from the outside is that they were uh fading away but that wasn't the case at all they were you know, still going strong so what they did was they started telling the audience what to expect in advance so they're going to alternate between big projects and small projects big leagues and small leagues big patches small patches and let them know in advance this one's going to be small, this one's going to be small, this one's going to be big, so that when the audience uh, saw there was going to be a big thing in two weeks or two months, they would be there for it, just like they would be there for a Cryptarian video. And if uh, Crypt didn't put on a stream or didn't put on a, a, a YouTube video, that's the time that the, the, his uh, viewers would go look for something else to replace him. Yeah. It's a good point of once you've gotten to a monthly or weekly consistency of um, you, you ha- yeah you have to have some you have to have some consistency. I know it can be it can be tough you know if we're talking about you know individuals who uh, have to figure out a way to have this consistent weekly monthly content while they're building the stuff with with their community. Um, it's uh, it's how the world works. 
cold blooded man. We're all sensitive. I, know, I was trying to think of like a, an inspirational point for it, but I people people's attention spans have just gotten uh, so much shorter. Um, I mean, like you try and follow the news cycle, <laughs> well, right? Um, so people's attention spans have just gotten so short. Where uh, um, if you if you miss that consistency, people forget so quickly. Um, like you know, this is not in the world of games at all. But remember, John Krasinski was doing this "Some Good News" video every week at the beginning of the pandemic, and then it people have already forgotten about it because he stopped doing it weekly. When he I... sold it to Viacom, didn't he? He did, yeah. Okay, well, that's bad news. Um, so there's some comfort too, though I think in uh, to not in counterpoint to what you just said. Um, because it comes from something else that you talked about in that uh, in that talk, which is that uh, focus on uh, it was to the effect of focusing on what a few people love rather than what a whole lot of people kind of like. And and I say that I think that there's some comfort in that, because in spite of the decreasing attention span um, that we have, maybe culturally there's still the individual craving for cool shit. So if you're putting out cool stuff and people are finding it and loving it, it is still possible for people to open up a larger attention span. So don't lose heart, you know, in the face of this, uh, you know, the, 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 the grinding feeling that you might be feeling of like, Oh God, I have to be like constantly putting out stuff and keeping people's attention span and like, ah, you know, like, yes, but also, you know, don't burn yourself out and have maybe more faith in the fact that the stuff that you're making that that people are loving is what's going to count at the end and and just like just keep making the stuff that people love yeah and i'll add two different points onto that uh one of uh both from you know other people in the industry one of them is from edgar wright um he has he's always said and i completely agree you have to have two or three qualities in your work as a creative. Um, and it is uh, very high quality work, um, always consistent, being nice. Um, if, you, uh, if you have two of those, you are going to do OK. So like, if you can't hit consistency, um, but you have really high quality work and you're always a pleasure to interact with, and you know, that's, you, that's how you, you could succeed still. Um, if you uh, if you are just not a nice person, you have to make sure your work is great and it's always on time. <laughs> um, and if you have all three, then like that's the unicorn. Um, and then the other uh, point is my, my my favorite GDC talk, and I know this is um, a bit of shilling because uh, it's from somebody from Wizards of the Coast, but I think it's it's such an applicable GDC talk as Mark Rosewater did um, twenty years twenty game design lessons, um, and this. He said something very similar to like focus on what, what people love instead of what people like with magic cards, where his his uh, story was um, when you know they rate magic cards um, and just how much people like them, scale of one to ten. And what they found is so they'd look at the magic cards in development. They look at the ones that got that on average got sevens and eights, and then they look at the ones that got half ones and twos and half nines and tens. The ones that got sevens and eights. Um, just did not succeed, and people didn't care about them. The ones who are half hated, half loved, did way better because, again, you found those people who loved that. Um, and so, I guess the the other part is like it's okay to have haters as long as you have people who love your work. Can and this also, um, so I have to reformulate my train of thought. Um, so let me start with a personal example, uh, and probably the example of a lot of other people who aren't, you know, they're not necessarily putting out a lot of content that has like immediate pop culture appeal. Um, you know, the, uh, pop culture and relatability combo that it can be so powerful. Um, you know, it's more of like personal projects, uh, you know, content that, it's just like sort of like outside that realm a little bit. Um, 
there's still going to be people that are going to engage with that. So you can also have some faith in the fact that if you're if you love doing it and you love putting it out and people are you know receptive to it that that can that there is still room for that as well like you you it's not just limited to like success is not limited to uh the sort of like pop culture related but even though the pop culture relatability thing can be that much more powerful like there is still like places for you to go with you know more personal content that doesn't fall into that there's a yeah i think there's a deeper thing that you could say um is your product has to have emotional resonance with the people it's being made for okay so like because i the, if it has no emotional resonance to them it's not going to succeed a lot of times you shortcut to there with pop culture because mm. that's a shared understanding and but sometimes you can get there without having to lean into the pop culture. Now, pop culture, I'm not saying you have to like you have to make a you know a caricature of of a famous actor. Um, pop culture means the things that are popular to that audience. So like if if you're making stuff for like a D and D or a Warhammer fan, like just think about what resonates with them about D and D or Warhammer, right? So um, there's a there's a there's a more fundamental truth there of uh, it has to have emotional resonance with the audience, and pop culture is the easier shortcut to get to that shared emotional um, resonance. I don't I don't want to ask too much of you, you know, and like putting on your uh, sociologist, uh, you know, philosophical hat, <laughs> but do you have some sense of what the commonality is there like why is it that this might seem like a self, self-evident question but what why is it that pop culture and it has such an immediate gratification for emotional resonance and what can we learn from that that can help us sort of like you know identify what the emotional content of our of you know a, a more personal project outside of pop culture can be yeah so um i mean the best way to put it is um our brain makes shortcuts right like that's that's where that's that's where stereotypes get ingrained unfortunately is because human brains make shortcuts and sometimes those shortcuts are bad uh and like let's take pop culture for instance the the reason why i think that gets to be resonant is it's 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 a shortcut for your brain too so like again when you you know you're a Pokemon fan and you see somebody who has made the like realistic 3D model of Bulbasaur, which looks kind of disgusting, but like that you you've gotten there really quickly because you you understood what they're going for without much context. So I think that's why pop culture tends to be very resonant with people because it's just a shortcut for their brain. The good news though is I have seen because that's become so ingrained in a lot of things, I've seen the opposite work where when somebody sees something that is so different from anything they've seen before, it can break their brain. And I've seen something where that breaks people's brains work. Really what doesn't work is something that gets to uh, something that plays within a space without any of this sort of resonance. And then that's where you get to a term called generic. And so you have to kind of like hit one of those extremes of, Pop, the pop culture shortcut because that's how brains work or breaking the brain with something that you that you've just never seen before there's i have to i don't remember this deviant art artist but this person made this like series of 100 monsters um and like this i this is like 6 years ago i saw this but it still impacts me because these monster designs are unlike any monster i've ever seen and it's still have never seen on the internet uh and they were just so inventive and so like that broke my brain because I just never seen such inventive looking monsters like that before. So I think you can still get to somebody without having to lean in pop culture. It, it's just it's it's just gonna be harder. So basically like Tim and Eric. <laughs> I don't watch the Tim and Eric show. It, oh, it, yeah, there's yeah. just really absurd com- comedians that uh 
act super awkwardly. So it was, it's, it was an adult. It seemed like one clip of, of the show. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're being so bizarre and they're breaking so many rules. Not, not even just be, like to be obscene, but just like of, of what your preconceptions are that it's exactly what you're talking about. They just they they smash every expectation that you have. So you're instantly fascinated because, <laughs> yeah, it's, anyway, um, ironically, now they're yeah, yeah. Actually working in advertising. <laughs> Or not so ironically, because they well, they know the magic trick. Because a lot of ads are trying to break your brain. Um, right. a lot of, yeah, a lot of ads I've seen, like, um, usually, like, the Super Bowl ads are really the only time I watch, like, what I'd consider legit ads. And, like, for instance, the um, Tide ad a year ago or so with David Harbour saying, like, every commercial is a Tide ad. Like, mm-hmm. Stuff like that, that kind of, um, people are trying to break your brains in advertising, too. I wonder too, and I don't, maybe you have uh, something to say to this that, uh, you know, there, rather than the, re- the relatability ties in on, on, a, on a broad level because they're, uh, they make sense to us um, because now we feel part of something you know like pop icons we're like we're all on the same team like we you know and we all we like the things that become like hugely popular uh resonate with a lot of people because of you know, like just our general like inclination as social creatures to want to you know be part of the thing and you know we like the thing that the other people like and blah, blah, blah. and i'm not just saying that it's like just mob mentality you know it's we're we're responding to something that is just part of our our human nature and and in that there are archetypes you can find like recurring themes that that exist within that and and i'm wondering if you know there's like there's a place that you can extract the recurring themes without having to uh you know it um if you're if you're not working in a pop culture area um and you're you have a, a you know, a private body of work that's more personal. Identifying the themes of that maybe can work a lot towards underscoring the relatability and 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 delivering that story. Like it, that's this is another thing that you hear bandied around so much that it kind of takes on this like icky feeling of like you know. But you hear like, "What's your story? Tell your story." But in a sense, that is the important thing is is telling the story, identifying you know like what are the sort of like archetypical themes that people already relate to and then and and try and show how your stuff is presenting that story because like you said there is nothing new under the sun so if you're not just trying to completely explode people's brains but you're also not working in pop culture areas what have the self-awareness to reflect on you know like what are the what are the major archetypes that you're trying to tell the story of Yeah, so to your example of like everyone asking Ken, like, tell me your story. Um, so when you're trying to give a synopsis of your story, like the elevator pitch, how can you do that? How can you shortcut it? And the unfortunate answer is you have to shortcut it through that person's brain. And that's why usually when like every movie pitch, it always starts like, oh, it's like the Matrix meets Harry Potter. Um, and so you like when you're explaining your idea to somebody, just have to remember you have to talk on their level and Mm -hmm. that that's why emotional resonance is um is the way to look at it um because people also aren't looking for um the same old thing over and over again but they need to they need something to be explained in their terms so they they understand what's unique about it Uh, because like the other thing i guess i should have said at the beginning is uh if you have nothing unique about your product it's probably not going to do that well you need that uniqueness so there's like um, there's, there's, um, that's why, like, my point is, like, your strength plus pop culture plus relatability, your strength is your product truth. It's the, um, it's the, the, the unique thing about your product. And you have to just marry that with how, um, with what's relatable to the audience you're trying to reach. So that's why everyone uses that shortcut of it's Harry Potter meets the Matrix. But you've just now combined two things into a new thing, and then you can then that opens up the space for you to say what you want to make. 
so to clarify are, are you are you saying that that makes for a, a good elevator pitch or you're going to turn people off like if you say harry potter meets the matrix people are going to glaze over or that is a, you know oh. a, go ahead i'm saying you need again that's probably a very juvenile example like i don't know if that will work with people or not but but like in general you have to talk in their terms so approaching it like a it's harry potter meets the matrix um yes you should you should approach it like that with people by again the point is you are talking about your product in terms that are relatable to the audience you're reaching out to because you're you you need to establish that baseline with them the table stakes about your product um so then you can show them that what's unique about it. Okay. Yeah. So that's, yeah. What I guess what I was clumsily trying to say before is that that idea of it kind of identifying the underlying themes that you have in common with that your product or your, you know, your vision, uh, your creative vision might have with other things that are pre-existing already um, it wouldn't be to say like, you know, identify that and then use that as like your elevator pitch or whatever. It would be more to say like, you know, it, identifying that it's Harry Potter meets the matrix. And so in what I'm the, how that would translate and what I'm trying to say would be like, okay, here we have reluctant Messiah meets, um, uh, I don't know. What's the Harry Potter archetype, whatever, you know? So then it's like, you're He's then, unassuming Messiah, I guess. <laughs> yeah, right, right. You know. Like they, they don't even know they are the, the chosen one. Yeah, yeah. So, so then there you have like the two archetypes that you're w working with, and you've identified it. And it's not that you then have to like go into the world and like be like super literal and explicit about that. It's more just like for personal knowledge that like, okay, now I identify those themes in my work, and 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 embellish on that from there it's it's I, I don't know i'm i'm just giving like clumsy clumsy advice to trying to give clumsy advice to people that like don't have pop culture references in their work maybe just take time to like you yeah. know, identify like what are the resonance points um yeah no the way you put it is correct i again in this talk i am using these shortcuts by saying it's harry potter meets the matrix um but you again just focus on the um the emotional resonance so it's the archetypes that people have known um have have known before um that that works too you don't have to just bring pop culture terms um you just have to provide a summary of your product in something that is relatable to that audience in whatever terms you can uh, that work for you and them right well, we went like super far into the philosophical. <laughs> Thank you for indulging me. Yeah, in that, yeah. Because that's always where my brain goes. Um, but uh, to rein it back into the, like the more practical uh, and substantial, um, are there freely available or inexpensive resources that people can access for you know learning more about um, marketing and um how to effectively do and, and put into practice a lot of the things that we've been talking about um yeah there's a service called youtube that i usually use to find <laughs> out <laughs> um, so so i you know the, the, gr the great thing is like you have a lot of great people um in the marketing space or just the gaming space who put out great content on youtube uh, mostly, mostly YouTube or, blo or blog posts. Um, I have yet to find a podcast which is like, which is um, always giving you giving me interesting marketing advice. Uh, so I haven't found that. But like, the, the marketers who um, who I really love are the ones who hey, we've been talking a lot philosophically. And actually, those are the marketers you want to follow because the, like the marketers you don't want to follow are ones that give you very concrete things to do because they're not seeing the big picture and their uh their advice they're giving you is probably going not going to age well so i look instead at the marketers who are thinking holistically and thinking about kind of like philosophical approaches and, and state of mind uh so like uh 
you know, one one great marketer is, is Seth Godin. Um, he he has a whole book that's about like build your product for the people who will love it. Like it, even if it's the five people who will love it, build it for them, not the five thousand people who might like it. Um, and so like, I I share that exact same mentality. And like he's also a marketer who's all about um, like how marketing is actually does good for people and products because the best kind of marketing again provides value. Um, that's I, I strongly believe that too. Uh, so he has a lot of great content that's just publicly available out there. Um, so a lot of people probably heard of Simon Sinek. Um, he did the whole uh, Golden Circle uh, TED Talks um, about like how Apple focused on the why, and then Microsoft and Dell focus on the what, and that's how Apple won basically the the um, the Mac versus PC game early on. Um, but Simon Sinek has a lot of freely available videos and content as well um, that's up on YouTube. Obviously, they all have a bunch of books. Uh, they have probably too many books for me to recommend a single one. Um, there is another nice YouTube channel I, I follow um, called Behind the Brand, where it's somebody who gets kind of uh, brand marketers on um, to sit down with them and just talk philosophically about how they built their brands. Um, and they're very different. Sometimes it's somebody from the music industry. Sometimes it's somebody from like the grocery store market industry. So you start to get some uh, you start to get some commonalities there. And then um, last but not least, uh, GDC has such great content. Like the GDC Vault is um, just has so much good stuff to um, to listen to listen in on. Well, you speak incredibly eloquent about a wide variety of things and are able to delve deeply into the more philosophical abstract versions of this. So when are we going to see your YouTube channel open up? <laughs> I don't have the time for that, unfortunately. Oh. I, I want to spend all my energies to make cool stuff for people. That's if that is the reason why I, I want to market in games is because like all of those liberal arts form together and just like making cool stuff and showing off that cool stuff to people. So yeah, I spent all my time at nights oh. doing that. But to get there, I, I like I love to think more psychologically and philosophically about this stuff. Well, in lieu of your YouTube platform not happening, will you come back again at some point in the future and talk to us more about these these things? Yeah, of course. I I do love talking about this. I am terrible at doing it myself, um, but I always love I always love sharing information and content with people because. It can seem like, especially you know, with so with just so too many buttons at everyone's fingertips, it can seem kind of like a scary and unknown world to people. Mm -hmm. um, and as you listen to, especially if you're thinking about marketing, as you listen to more of these marketers who talk more from the philosophical and psychological standpoint, you'll realize it's actually pretty simple. And when you're getting really complex things from people, be wary of that, mm -hmm. um, because I, like. I feel like the reason why I've been successful in marketing is because it's all down to logic. And if you just think about things logically, you'll probably, for the most part, come across the right solution. Yeah, it's a the topic of marketing is one that I think that we will revisit a lot in this podcast. And we may, fair warning to everyone listening, we may repeat the same ground again with either with other people or have uh, previous guests on to talk about similar things again, but it's I think it's all in the effort of making the information as available as it as it can be, you know. And like the one episode that you do on marketing is going to get lost in the shuffle, you know. So having people come on again, having other people come on to share different aspects on the same topic, this is all you know. This is something that I think that we would really like to do in the future. So. And, and on that, um, if I could just if I could just add, like, don't just listen to me. Um, the, the the way that I've been successful is seeing multiple opinions, um, because everyone has different approaches. Like you know, I have my top ten list. Um, I picked and pulled as as I learned things over the years and saw things that worked from other marketers. But um, listen to if you're interested in the space, listen to a variety of people. Um, don't take anything you hear as like, okay, this is just the truth. I'm going to move forward with it. Um, hear from multiple sources, and then you'll see the commonalities, and that'll help you if, if you're really curious about what does work in marketing. 
we're uh, we are going to have the uh, top ten list that you had uh, mentioned throughout this video available in the uh, comment sections and in the text and wherever you uh, consume this, you'll find the, the document. Um, but I also want to mention that originally our intent was to have somebody on here uh, with you to like say, I have this product, what can I do? That sort of thing. So it'd be a more one-to-one -one, uh, connection of how to personal advice type thing. And then maybe uh, maybe next time if we have uh, uh, have you back on, then we can have somebody that would uh, benefit like as like a mini mentorship type thing. Yeah, that sounds really great. Um, definitely, I recommend me seeing it beforehand because also great marketing takes great preparation. <laughs> So off the cuff, I'll probably give that person very bad marketing. That's uh, great. If I see it and think about it, then I'll give them better marketing. Well, we can do this twice then. We can give you the uh, one episode of the really bad advice, and then two weeks later you come back like, this is what I meant to say. No. Yeah, we'll have to right. start paying you for yeah. all of the marketing advice that we're going to start squeezing out of you. <laughs> oh, no, this is this is all added value to, to help people out. So we do want to... Um, a lot of times like, there are independent people or freelance people that are on here uh, giving advice and joining us for the podcast, but uh, you're part of a big corporate entity, so I'm not sure uh, what you would like to shout out, if anything, or maybe you have some friends that are working on some uh, projects, <laughs> or maybe your zombie punch game is going to finally come out next year. Uh, anything you'd like to add, just uh, feel free. No, no shout outs. I mean, I don't have to shout out Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> just, well, uh, something... just a thank you to you two. For... Yeah. No, thank um, you. Really. No, like, uh, yeah. I mean, I could talk about the product Dungeons Dragons has coming out, but you can see that online. Well, what's something? To... What's something else? <laughs> it, what's something else? Just in the world generally, uh, it doesn't have definitely doesn't have to be Dungeons and Dragons related. It doesn't even have to be like art or marketing related. What's something in the world that's happening that you're excited about? Everyone should watch the Netflix documentary "The Social Dilemma." Okay, it's pretty depressing. <laughs> Very true, um, but you wait till the credits. They gave you some really good steps for um, for things that you can do to kind of reduce your dependency on on social media. Um, so it, it's something that I um, I am passionate about. Like uh, for instance, if you turn off the social media notifications on your phone, uh, stuff like that. Anyways, I so if I could plug one thing, it's it's not related to anything I work on. It's um, the social dilemma documentaries. Uh, really good one. Everyone, everyone should give it a watch. I'm so glad. Well, if that hurts you, because you're doing marketing on social oh, media. Oh no! Again, marketing, nothing new under the sun, and it's all about providing value. Um, I think the uh, okay, in social media, they didn't give the other part of the story, um, which is from the marketing side of things. So, um, social networks, their goal is to extract as much time on screen as possible from users. Our job for marketers and for actually sorry companies in general is to make their feed good but not perfect because they want they um, they want it to be um, like at a good enough rate where people want to scroll through but not perfect so that the best content always gets to the top because they want people to pay for that opportunity to get their stuff to the top. Um, so, Anyways, there's um, there will always be ways to market products. There's the universal, universal truths that have existed for years um, that will uh, have you know uh, evolved with social media, but will continue to do well wherever people consume their content. Well, I'm really happy about one thing that you said in your review of the uh, the what, what's the documentary called? You just said it. I, I A just... social dilemma. The social dilemma, I've, yeah, I've been hearing lots of people sort of talk about it, but you're the first person that has pointed out that at the end, they have things that you can doing like action, like things that you can do to um, uh, help mitigate <laughs> some of the because like hearing about the documentary yeah. is like hearing about a car wreck. It's like, yeah, that sounds really interesting. I don't know <laughs> if I want to go look at that because it seems pretty gross and I can guess what it looks like. Um, but if you're giving me actionable things that I can do to help clean up the mess, I'm much more inclined to go look at the car accident with you. Yeah, um, they have some good, they, good stuff at the end, simple stuff, but it's cool. good. All right. Rad. Well, I think that about does it, man. Thank you so, so, so much for your time. This has been uh, incredibly 
informative and really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Always happy chatting about this stuff with everybody. Thanks again, dude. Really uh, good seeing you again.